Welcome to Writer Writer Pants on Fire, where authors talk about things that never happened to people who don't exist. I'm your host, Mindy McGinnis. You can check out my books and social media at mindymcginnis.com and visit the Writer Writer Pants on Fire blog at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. Support the podcast through Patreon for weekly writing advice, query, and first page critiques, as well as exclusive episodes featuring agent and editor interviews. Visit patreon.com forward slash Mindy McGinnis to learn more. Today's guest is Sandra Gullick, an American-born Canadian novelist. She's the author of The Shadow Queen and Mistress of the Sun, novels set in the court of Louis XIV, The Sun King, and a trilogy of novels based on the life of Josephine Bonaparte, as well as The Game of Hope, a YA historical about Josephine's daughter. Sandra joined me today to talk about how publishing has changed over time, the differences in the Canadian publishing world versus the American, and researching for historical novels. Walk through an enchanted autumn wood, where leaves shine like red candy apples by day, and blood is spilled by flesh-eating monsters at night. The rules are simple. Do not travel from the path. Do not linger after dark. Do not ignore the calling. The Wood by Chelsea Babolsky. My listeners are always interested to learn how successful writers landed their agents. So if you could share the story behind your agent hunt. My agent hunt was a little unusual because this was a very long time ago. And in Canada, which was a small publishing world, I was working as an editor. A friend of mine decided to leave the publishing house she was working for and start an agency. I was determined to be represented by her. For years, I would send her proposals. And for years, she would reject them. And then her agency got bought by Bruce Westwood. I continued to send proposals to the agent I had been sending to before. And one, they were interested in, but the agent was full. And so she said, but someone new has just joined us. And this was Jan Whitford. The agent sent me the type of letter every author dreams of, and that's that I am just building my client list, and I would be delighted to look at your proposal. So this was luck both perseverance and luck that happened to come upon an agent who was new in the business and was looking for someone. It turned out to be the best in Canada and the agency is the best in Canada. But from there, of course, it entailed lots of rewriting and rewriting and honing, which is what I think the main thing agents do is get you to push further into the manuscript before sending it out. By the time it was ready to send out, two Canadian publishers were interested in it, Penguin and HarperCollins, which Mm -hmm. was very exciting for me because, frankly, I never expected anyone to want this project. This was the Josephine B. trilogy. But Penguin wanted world rights. And my agent and I wanted to hold on to world international rights. These were very small numbers in terms of the advances that were being offered. But HarperCollins was agreeable to allowing us to hold on to the world rights. I really loved the editor at HarperCollins, Iris Topham. At that point, the Josephine story was a two-volume novel. Iris said, that just never works. People don't by mm-hmm. two volume novels. And so I was really discouraged and but that night I woke up in the middle of the night and I realized it's a trilogy or it could be a trilogy. And so all of a sudden the titles fell into place and the arc of this story I phoned my agent in the morning and told her and she called Iris and Iris says done. The first one it might have been in third draft but it wasn't very far along. So I panicked. It was exciting, but it was uh, nerve-wracking. I wasn't sure I could do Mm -hmm. it. And then further on, the international sales that we had held on to were not materializing at all. We were uh, rejected by virtually every 
major publisher in the United States and Europe. Again, luck hit. A German scout read it and loved it, made a fantastic offer for it. All of a sudden, that woke up the publishing world, and all of a sudden, everybody else wanted it too, because if Kruger was putting its stamp of approval on it, then it must be good. So it was Mm -hmm. exciting. It was uh, magical. When was this occurring, your first foray into publishing? 1998. I think the last of the trilogy was published in 2000. Can you talk about some of the differences in the Canadian publishing world versus the American? I think that could be really interesting. I'm not sure how much of a difference there is today. At that time in Canada, it was, like I said, a very small world, and you didn't have to have an agent. It certainly helped Mm -hmm. to have an agent, but you didn't have to have one. If you were pitching to the United States, you had to have an agent. You could be well-published in Canada, but not be selling very many books at all. So the international market was very important to Canadian authors, much more so than it would be to U.S. authors who have a large market built in. The Canadian market, the bestseller list, tends to be dominated, at least it used to be at one time, by literary novels. So there wasn't as much of an emphasis on genre novels or commercial fiction. I think that's Mm -hmm. changed a great deal. Let's talk about your novels. You write primarily historical fiction, which requires quite a bit of research. And a lot of people, when they're diving into writing a historical, they are intimidated by that idea. So if you could tell us a little bit about your research process, that could be really helpful. Well, they're wise to be intimidated by it because it's a deep dive into material and it can be expensive because of travel the cost of books, consultants, and stuff like that. But if you love research, and if you love historical fiction, you're just going to do it, no matter what. I get obsessive about finding out things that aren't apparent. I think, oh, the answer has to be somewhere, and I I go crazy trying to find the answers. I tend to want to know everything. And this can stand in my way because it can be a great procrastination, a way to avoid actually getting at the writing. So I'm not sure this is to my advantage, but it is the way I have worked. And it's also why I I publish so slowly. I'm a three or four year kind of writer and, and that's writing full time. So, or researching or procrastinating full time. In my research, I begin with books and online sites, which fortunately there are more and more. Chat groups of historians can be of great help, especially if they have a question. Reaching out to consultants, identifying your consultants that you're going to need is wonderful. I did that for The Game of Hope, my last publication. I did that by seeking out the authors of various books that were pertinent to my subject, and they would tell me who I could reach out to. And then also in historical chat groups, I found some very good consultants that way. For the Game of Hope, I also, for the first time, hired student researchers because I had a very hard time finding information about Duroc, who was my main character's love interest. And students in universities have access to archives and libraries that people on the outside don't have access to. And then there's travel, travel to France, which is always delightful. I needed to locate the location of the school. I needed to talk to certain consultants. I needed to just get a sense of the geography. And how much do you think the internet has changed research? Because I know you're talking about doing travel and all of those things. And I know lots of people that write about places they haven't been to. And for example, I was talking to someone yesterday who wrote books that are set in Berlin. And she used Google Maps and Google Street View. You can just drop 
your vision right down in the middle of the street and look around and see things. So can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the different ways of research that are involved and whether or not you're going to get a more immersive experience doing the actual traveling? Google Maps or Google Search certainly helped me find old maps of the school. I could see the layout of the school, and this material would have been almost impossible to find in the days before the internet. I think in terms of the view, you know, I, you can get a sense of the topography and stuff like that, but in terms of the street view, that's harder if it's historical. It's, it's wonderful. The internet is fantastic for research. I think it was my second book in a handful of deaths. I was writing scenes that were set in the Southwest, the American Southwest. And it was a place at that time I had never been. It was in our country, but I was not in a position to be traveling. And so I used Google and um, Street View and just walking around. I didn't know what kind of plant life there was. I know that there's the desert at one point, but... I don't know when the desert begins. I don't know what the desert looks like, to be honest with you. So at that point in my life, right. I didn't. So I, I just used Google and it helped a lot. It helped a lot. And actually in using it, I found a, a scene occurred and it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole book. Because of using Google Street View, I think it was in Nebraska and there's there was this old, old cemetery just in the middle of nowhere there's nothing around no cars no trees just nothing and there's just this old cemetery and it was so visually striking and it ended up spawning a scene in the book and it's one of my favorite scenes so have you had anything like that happen where something that you come across in your research actually affects the book in a plot or in a scene that is great story I just love that. I'm just trying to think. Right now, I'm researching falconry. I can get videos of the cameras are attached to these birds, Mm -hmm. and you can see what they're seeing and things like that. And I don't know how much of that I would use, but it certainly takes one's breath away. Now I'm researching the Elizabethan era. There are a lot of Elizabethan living history societies and videos online and and television series on what it would be like to live in those times. It's just, it's so amazing what you can find. Yeah. I also like uh, YouTube for um, how to skin a chicken and stuff like that. It's fantastic. Three secrets, one decision, and a friendship that will change everything. Told through the journal entries of the two main characters, this emotional story chronicles Melly's life-altering choice after an unspeakable act and her friend's determination to help her. Find your own truth in this book about reproductive rights that readers are calling powerful, gut-wrenching, important, and beautifully written. What They Don't Know by Nicole Maggi is on sale now. When you are doing this research very in-depth, and you also at some point have a flowing line of your book and how you want your book to operate, the plot, so how do you determine when to blur the line of fact with fiction for the purposes of your plot or for character growth? That's a very good question. And it's a problem with every book. I'm almost religious about sticking to the fact for a biographical novel. Ultimately, it's the story that is the most important thing. So at some point, I have to start pruning fact Mm -hmm. and in order to strengthen. And usually this entails cutting characters. Historically, the family world anyway was very populated with people. There were more children, there were more siblings, there were there were maids and servants everywhere, and they had children. And so you just can't do that to today's reader. Or a book would suffer terribly. Mm-hmm. So I end up having to cut characters in in the game of hope I cut one of the sisters 
from the story, and that was hard. It was hard to take her out. Eliza Monroe, who, who is daughter of uh, a man who became the president of the United States, I made her a lot younger than she was, in fact, at that time. Mm-hmm. Major changes that I make, I acknowledge in the in my author's notes so that a reader knows. Basically, I try to stick to the facts as much as I can. With The Game of Hope, I had uh, some complications because it was jiving with a, what I had written a decade before in the Josephine B. Trilogy. Mm-hmm. I had to stick with those facts that I that timeline, but in the meantime, I had discovered that things might have been a little different. I had to choose to stay with the facts of the trilogy mm-hmm. as opposed to the facts, historical facts. Uh-huh. Anyway, none of these things were really ma- major, but it was an interesting conundrum. Absolutely. So in the situation where you chose to age a character down, what was the plot demand that Mm -hmm. made that necessary? I cast Eliza as a herald figure because her father was the U.S. diplomat to France. He would have information about what was going on internationally and things that were going on in France. Mm -hmm. So it was useful to have Eliza inform Hortense uh, what the heck was going on. Mm -hmm. I cast her as something of an annoying figure. In fact, at one point, my editors wanted me to cut her (laughs) because she was so annoying. But I solved that a little bit by making her younger. Mm -hmm. And clearly, an annoying youngster is better than an annoying peer. And I think it works now. The things that the plot calls for in order to keep the fiction interesting for your reader rather than sticking religiously to the facts. When it comes to personality, you're saying that you took the personality of this person and you made her a somewhat annoying figure. When you do something like that with the real person, is that difficult at times? Like, Are you basing that on any of your research or are, are you just assigning a personality to her that you need uh, for plot? Well, I had an impression of her from my research that she was, in fact, an annoying person. Mm-hmm. She was a bit snooty as an adult. I have one image of her as a youngster and she looks like a brat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I didn't have an awful lot to go on, but this was my impression. Sometimes it takes very little. You don't have very much information. And from the little you have, you can form a character. I'm thinking in particular of the last book in the Josephine B. trilogy. I was so nervous about how to bring the Pope on Sure. Stage, because that would be intimidating, as you can imagine. And then I read that he had a high, squeaky voice. Mm-hmm. And, and all of a sudden, I could visualize this man. And sometimes that's all you need is some tiny little personal detail about someone to form a character around. That's very true. I have dabbled for years, like probably 20 years. I would love to write a book about Nero's mother. She was a fascinating person. I've always wanted to write about Agrippina, Nero's mother. I've done the research. I'm intimidated by attempting the novel, to be honest with you. You do pick up things about people and you do pick up their personalities. But in the case of when you're researching women... The writings from the time are all written by men. And when you're researching a powerful woman or a woman who has any kind of political influence, typically the men resent that. So what they're writing about these women is very rarely anything positive or complimentary. You end up being very aware of this, this sexist bias in the reporting of these women in history about who they were because the people that are telling you about them, the only writing that has survived and been preserved was written by men. So how do you balance something like that when you're working in historical research? Because if we believe all of the writing that we see, all of these women were horrible, bitchy, power hungry, rabid people. 
Exactly. I know. This was especially true when I was researching the, the Josephine Bonaparte's mm-hmm. life, because she has been very negatively portrayed by male historians. And I was a novice to historical research uh, when I began that trilogy. And so I asked consultants in France, I said, well, what about this? Was she a a whore? She liked to have orgies. They say that she did this, she did. And they said, "Uh, uh, 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 none of that's true. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I said, well, what about this historian who published the letter that she wrote to her lover? One of my consultants said, you know, it's curious, that letter has never been seen. In other words, you know, there's a letter that would be worth so much Mm -hmm. money. How come it's never been produced? So I began to realize that what you read in books is not always true, and to begin to make my own judgments Mm -hmm. about what's positive and what's negative. When historians complained about Josephine's entrepreneurial ventures, I thought, well, good for Mm -hmm. her. You know, whereas they were complaining she was draining Napoleon's money, whereas that wasn't true. It was definitely a case of I would look at what's the evidence. Mm -hmm. Oh, for example, they would say she went to Venice to have an affair with her lover. And in fact, This so-called lover, who I don't personally believe was her lover, was nowhere near Venice at the time. And she had been sent by Napoleon as his representative in the negotiations with Mm -hmm. Venice. Here she was as being a diplomat, and they're downgrading her into this sneaky, it was all wishful thinking on Mm -hmm. their part. Yeah, it can be really tricky when you're doing... Yeah. That research. And I know one of the things yeah. that I came across in reading about Agrippina, it was from a historian who was a contemporary of hers that just absolutely hated her. And one of the reasons that the, he disliked her is because he said she walked like a man. <laughs> there you That's go. That's all he needed. <laughs> like, he didn't like the way she walked. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I love Good that. I love that detail. I love that you walk like a man. Yeah. And just the fact that yeah. she walked yeah. like a man has me going, oh, I, feel like uh-huh. I know something about you now. It's interesting now, novels being written about the Greek and Roman deities. Mm-hmm. You know, I just finished uh, House of Names mm-hmm. by Colm Tobin, and I'm starting um, Home mm-hmm. Fire. I forget the author's name, which is about Agamemnon. It's very interesting revisiting these myths from a very realistic perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think you should write this novel. Maybe someday. It's it's on my bucket list of things I want to write. It's up there. The Game of Hope is your first YA novel. So what made you decide to dip into the world of writing Mm -hmm. for teens? This came at me um, by surprise. Penguin. Canada, um, and I guess U.S., proposed it to me. Um, They sent this box to my agent, wrapped in a big bow. Inside the box was a proposal, an offer, and chocolates and candies and other bows and all that frou-frou stuff. So it was kind of beautifully irresistible. At the same time, it wasn't what I had in mind to be doing. So I had to think about it very, very carefully because I hadn't been in the Napoleonic world for one thing. The, one of, the proposal was that I would write two YAs and one of them had to be about Josephine Bonaparte's daughter, Hortense. And so going back into the Napoleonic era was, for one thing, when I finished the trilogy, I was simply exhausted And I had sold off my Napoleonic collection of books in order to make room on my shelves for books about the Mm -hmm. Sun Court, which I figured I'd be writing about for the rest of my life. So I really had to think about it. And I did for about a month or two. I uh, revisited Hortense's story to see if there was a good story in her teen years. And Mm -hmm. there was. Also, I'd always been interested in exploring the life of teenagers historically. This was something I had wanted to explore and develop back 
in the days before I was a writer, uh, when I was working for a publishing house. And I love reading. Some of the YA today is just Mm -hmm. mind-blowing. This was an interesting proposition. And after studying enough about Hortense's story, I realized I wanted to write this book. It was a pleasure going back into the Napoleonic world and a pleasure exploring Hortense. I'm happily working on another YA. It's a very exciting period of life to Mm -hmm. write about. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of vitality in that age range, and that's one of the reasons why I write that range. Yes, it's very um, energetic and idealistic, and the world is open, you know, everything is open. It's it's very Mm -hmm. exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So tell us about what's up next for you. What are you working on now? And where can listeners find you online? Well, right now I am doing the research and plotting this book about a girl falconer in Elizabethan England, who, according to legend, becomes Queen Elizabeth I's master falconer which all by itself would be a very int- is a very interesting story because falconry was at that time a strictly mm-hmm. a male vocation it's it's quite different from anything else i've written one mm-hmm. thing it's in england this is new all my other works have been set in france it's also not strictly a biographical novel i mean what we know about this woman is expressed in two mm-hmm. paragraphs that's mm-hmm. all there is and it's Contested. So it's not really a biographical novel in the sense that I have always had volumes of biographies to read about any character I've written about. So that isn't the case. And it's left me quite free to write a story in quite a different way. And at first, I was dismayed because I kind of like that those restrictions of facts to uh, to create a story within but this has left me quite free and I'm starting to like that I believe I might have something of a fantasy element in this learning about raptors is is scary and exciting I'm not a birder and one of the things I'm doing which is something of a diversion, but entirely pleasant, is I'm painting raptors That's just awesome. for fun. It's something I lose myself in. And, and because writing is so mm-hmm. cerebral and at the computer, um, it's nice to get to go into something that's yep. physical. You know, it's stuff, Absolutely. paint, paint and water. And I like it very much. It's finding me online, I'm I believe I'm most everywhere online. This is another one of my Mm -hmm. diversions. I'm on Twitter as Sandra under slash Gulland and Facebook as novelist Sandra Gulland and on Instagram, Flickr and Goodreads simply as Sandra Gulland and all of these links and more can be found on my website, sandragulland.com. Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire is produced by Mindy McGinnis. Music by Jack Corbel. If you find the podcast or blog helpful, please consider making a donation by visiting GoFundMe.com and searching for Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire. Or visit the blog by going to WriterWriterPantsOnFire.blogspot.com. Click on the podcast tab and then the PayPal button. I'm your host, Mindy McGinnis. Join me next week for another episode of Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire, where writers talk about things that never happened to people that don't exist.